what's up, gangsters? And, well, it's already a long-running tradition over here at uh, Horrible Reviews to start the year off with a video where I take a look back at some of the best movies I've watched the previous year. But, you know, with the whole my YouTube channel getting deleted, I wasn't really able to do so earlier this year. But hey, look at us now, it's, it's back, the channel is back. And I guess it's never too late to, you know, like, talk about some uh, random movies. So, uh, here we are. A few notes before we begin, as always. Um, the best in the title is, I guess it's mostly there because, you know, it, it looks good as a, as a title to a video. More accurate would probably be um, most interesting or like most noteworthy. And I know I have a reputation to mostly talk about uh, like these crazy, disturbing, horror and exploitation type movies. I mean, obviously, because, well, that is what I focus on with this channel. It's just, personally, I, I love cinema in general and I actually love these videos because it gives me the opportunity to talk about a wide variety of different movies. So if you click this video hoping to just see like a bunch of like crazy movies being recommended, just a, a little heads up, it's, it's really like a little bit of everything and hope it's not too disappointing. Mm -mm -mm. Stop it. Also, um, the footage that I use in these videos, the, the clips that I show from the movies, it's almost all taken from trailers that I found on YouTube. So with that comes the fact that uh, the, the, the quality is kind of all over the place. Which is a shame because a lot of these movies actually have like beautiful high definition transfers. Just not all of them you can find back on, uh, on YouTube. And you know, I just have this to work with, otherwise it would have taken me like way too long to, to, to finish this video. You know, it's just a little something to, to keep in mind while watching. As well as that the, the editing is not, you know, like it's not like my usual videos, in the sense that, you know, like what you see doesn't per se correlate with, with what I'm saying, but it's all just because of the footage I have to work with and like the time I try to save. Okay, well that's enough rambling for the introduction. Like I said, I tried to go for a uh, wide variety of not too obvious titles. So, um, 30 movies from 13 countries spanning 7 decades and a wide range of genres. Let's go. Let's start with The 5,000 Fingers of Dr. T, a family film musical written by the one and only Dr. Seuss. It tells the story of a, a little boy who ends up in a surreal world where a dictator enslaves kids to play his huge piano. Uh, it, it's wonderful though. The, the sets, the colors, it's all so playful. The music is, is pretty good and overall it's just a jolly time. Honestly, not much more to add to that. Even though it might be a movie for kids, I highly enjoyed it as a uh, functioning adult. Uh, so yeah, the best in the title really doesn't hold up here, as After Last Season is easily the worst movie on the list. Perhaps even in the history of mankind. An almost fable so bad it's good movie, as the director fully went out of his way to make sure nobody would ever see it again. It's mind-bogglingly inept. The overly ambitious storyline is immensely contrasted by its extremely bland production design. It features some of the laziest animation scenes you'll ever see that go on for what feels like hours. <laughs> this is uh, definitely something you have to see for yourself to believe. Like, ugh. As if I am not there. Surprisingly an Irish production, as this movie is set in and told in the language of Bosnia during the Bosnian War. We follow a young teacher who ends up being captured and placed in a kind of brothel for the soldier's enjoyment, if you will. Really well directed and performed, this movie manages to show the horrors of a war not often depicted in cinema on a very personal level without getting too gratuitously violent. Still, it is pretty disturbing. So if you're in the mood for a bleak, realistically depressing, but at the same time well-made and good-looking movie, yeah, check it out. From Indonesia we have Batch 81, a challenging movie based on current events at the time, which tells the story of uh, a batch get it, of students going through intense hazing in order to join a uh, popular fraternity. Partly based on the, the film's producer's son who went through a similar experience, the movie doubles as a commentary on the country's martial law dictatorship which ended shortly before this movie was released. So interesting from a historical point of view as well as just a pretty effective movie on its own. Ah, would you look at that, I'm actually recommending a Lucifer Valentine movie. 
black metal veins. <laughs> so, uh, from the director behind the infamous Vomit Gore movies, comes this documentary on crack and heroin addicts. It still has that signature Lucifer Valentine audiovisual style, which I still don't care for, like, at all. But in between, we do get a fascinating look at a, a very specific part of society. Yeah, this will definitely leave you with a feeling of, ugh, you know, like, sad and depressed. For which I'll applaud the director, as most of his movies will just leave you with a feeling of, uh, <laughs> Very edgy Lucifer Valentine. Definitely not for everybody, but yeah. Café Funiculi Funicula. A Japanese movie I randomly put on during a flight, but I'm glad I did because I am. Uh, I low-key love this. It's about this cafe in which you'll find a magical chair which allows a person to travel back in time. But, all of which of course comes with a lot of rules, which of course causes a lot of conflict. At times the movie comes dangerously close to being overly melodramatic, but ultimately it ends up balancing things out quite nicely, resulting in an effective, cute, feel-good drama. It just has this overall quite likable feel to it. As often with movies with time travel elements, <laughs> not something to overthink, but if you just take it for what it is, you'll most likely end up having a good time. The Devil's Trap, and you're gonna find a bunch of Czechoslovak movies on this list as I've been watching and loving a, a whole lot of them the past year. From František Vlachil, best known for the universally acclaimed Marketa Lazarova, I'd pick this title instead as it's, you know, it's, it's somewhat lesser known, but pretty close in greatness, just a lot smaller in scale. Set in the 16th century, where during a drought, a priest visits a small village and is soon to point fingers at the local miller, accusing him of witchcraft. You know, causing the drought. But it's the way the story is told, the somewhat trademark lo-fi sound design and borderline surreal magical ending that makes for quite the experience. It's admittedly not an easy watch, it's slowly paced, but ultimately quite rewarding, especially if, like me, you're always down for a good old medieval witchcraft movie. I'm quite new to Greek cinema, but Theo Angelopoulos' Eternity and a Day pretty much just blew me away. An almost poetic story concerning an old man who is sad and feels unfulfilled despite being a respected writer, crossing paths with a young boy, which results in a uh, peculiar friendship, which in turn makes the man reflect on his life. And, oh man, this, this movie is so well made. Uh, the many long takes filled with these, these subtle but meticulously well calculated pans and zooms, they're marvelous. The soundtrack is probably the best I've heard all year. And again, it's, it's almost poetic themes will hit you right in the feels. Yeah, beautiful movie. And then from Poland, Eva wants to sleep. And Man, what a cute movie this is. It's a comedy about a young, naive girl who seems to keep getting herself into all kinds of wacky situations, all while she's just looking for a place to sleep. Haven't we all been there? It's quite theatrical, and most of the humor and comedic situations are based on coincidental misunderstandings, but it never feels forced or, or, or gets tiring. It's actually consistently pretty funny. And if you combine that with this, this sort of fabricated, out of this world vibe, again, you know, like it's, it's pretty theatrical, you got yourself quite a winner in my book. So yeah, it's a really cute, goofy little movie. But now, for some Hong Kong nastiness, it's Hell Has No Boundary. On the surface, it's a, a, a pretty straightforward a supernatural slasher about a girl who comes back from a camping trip all possessed and now uses her newfound powers to kill people she doesn't like. But it's, I don't know, it's just a bunch of fun. It's kind of hard for me to, to put my finger on what exactly made this movie. But, uh, I don't know, it, it just comes with, with a bunch of pretty memorable, brutal scenes. It's not overtly bonkers, as one comes to expect from these uh, Hong Kong Category 3 flicks, especially with this one being directed by the guy who would go on to direct Seeding of a Ghost. But, 
a fun time regardless. Now, this is something else. Innocence unprotected. From Dusan Makaviev, in general, I'm sorry if I'm butchering all of these names. Ugh. The Serbian filmmaker who treated us to sweet movie and who might actually have ended up being my favorite filmmaker of the past year. This is a fascinatingly weird hybrid of a movie, combining the uh, restoration of the first Serbian sound film, which was banned in its time, together with documentary bits following the surviving cast and crew of that movie, as well as stock footage of occupied Czechoslovakia. The result is quite unique. The original movie itself, you know, the, the, the old one, it, it, it's fun, it's innocent and obvious in an amateuristic way, and the history behind it is, is actually quite interesting unto its own, but together with the uh, elements of documentary and stock footage, it elevates the end product to a completely new kind of film. I'm, I'm not quite sure how much credit should go to uh, Makalviev, the director, as the majority of this movie is made of, uh, from the original, the, the, the old movie, but then again, the way it's all cut together definitely has his stamp on it. It's uh, good stuff. But now it's time to feel sad and depressed with Johnny Got His Gun, the only movie directed by writer Dalton Trumbo, based on one of his own novels. It, wow, it, it had honestly been a while since I felt so anxious, almost nauseated while watching a movie, as for the majority of this, we follow a limpless, almost faceless, bedridden war veteran who remains completely conscious but without any means of communication, unbeknownst to the hospital staff. What the fuck would you do in a situation like that? The movie intercuts to uh, the man's flashbacks and, and dream sequences, but ultimately he's just lying there, a fate arguably worse than that. Very much a uh, nightmarish experience, I, I can't say I actually enjoyed this, but it's been on my mind ever since and it very much feels like something I should share with you guys. So, uh, well, uh, here you go, do with it what you want. But first, Let's switch to something a little more uplifting, Loves of a Blonde. An early film from perhaps Czechoslovak's biggest export filmmaker Miloš Forman, this is such a cute, charming comedy with some welcoming elements of drama. About a young girl out and about to find love, which she eventually does find in this boy, who ends up not returning her calls, so to speak. It's, it's so funny though, a bunch of the big set pieces, if you will, mostly with um, non-professional actors and a lot of somewhat improvised dialogue, they work like a charm. You could and can read some social commentary into all of this, but at the very same time, you can also just simply enjoy this as a, you know, just a really cute romantic comedy. And then some exploitation horror with Luther the Geek. Picked up by Troma and often I feel somewhat mismarketed as a bit of a uh, campy horror comedy. Or you know maybe that was just me that I always had the idea that it was gonna be something like that. Because in, in actuality this is a, a pretty straight, pretty mean-spirited horror movie with psycho on the loose and home invasion elements. The guy playing Luther, he's genuinely frightening, disturbed. We, we get some pretty good gore, some nudity. Yeah, really, what, what more do you want from a 80s horror movie? Yeah, um, not really much else to add to all of that. I was pleasantly surprised by this one. It's a fun piece of uh, exploitation cinema. And back to Czechoslovakia for Morgiana. A little slow, took me a while to get into, but eventually, in the end, it won me over with, um, well, probably first of all, an amazing soundtrack by the guy who also scored Valerie and her Week of Wonders, but also just a bunch of nice visuals, specifically the, uh, the costumes and, and makeup, as well as the location and sets as well as um, some pretty wild handheld POV shots from the perspective of the titular cat. Yeah. It's a surreal-ish, horror-ish movie. The plot didn't even really make all that much sense to me, or perhaps more so that it didn't really grab me all that much. And like I said, it, it honestly did take me a while to get into, but as an audio-visual experience, I, yeah, I very much enjoyed it. 
The only animated movie on this list, from Japan, it's Perfect Blue. Definitely a, uh, a classic in its genre. It's this semi-surreal psychological horror movie about a pop star turned actress being stalked by this creepy dude and then all kinds of weird shit starts to happen. Initially I wasn't even sure if I was gonna like this. Admittedly, it really took me a while to appreciate it, but it, it ended up being quite a, um, it's it's hard to describe, but, but like a, a deeply visceral experience. The animation is fantastic. I still don't know what the fuck was going on, but the whole blurring the line between reality and, and fantasy makes for quite the experience. It's, uh, <laughs> I guess it's just one of those movies you just have to give a chance, despite me struggling to convince you why exactly. Piercing from Nicolas Pesci, whose previous movie, The Eyes of My Mother, I'm, I absolutely loved. This is quite something else though. And oh shit, I, I actually like really just now realized that he directed the new Grudge movie on the list. Uh oh. Well, anyway, about a guy planning a murder on an escort, and that's it. Definitely, I, I'd say a, a case of uh, style over substance, but that's not always a bad thing. At least I definitely don't think it is here in this case. The soundtrack borrows heavily from uh, classic Giallo movies, which works perfectly in combination with its, its colorful visuals, I in a way forming a somewhat unexpected love letter to the Giallo. It might be a cheap trick, you know, like to, to use like these amazing soundtracks, but I, I don't know, it, it, it worked. It's slowly paced, but Never boring, I'd say. I mean, it's, it's, it's highly stylized, so it provides enough to, to look at and listen to throughout its running time. Yeah, I am. Um, I liked it. Ah, Pretty Poison. A blind buy that I got purely based on the Blu-ray cover, and well, the fact that it stars Anthony Perkins. And well, I'm, I'm glad I picked it up because, I don't know, I feel like it's a bit of a hidden gem. Anthony Perkins stars as this man recently released from a mental institute, who now tries to impress a young girl by pretending to be a CIA agent, but soon gets more than he bargained for. I, uh, I, I just love the awkward chemistry between the two leads. It works really well. As well as the tone of the movie, which flows seamlessly from quirky dark comedy to romance to thriller and back. I, I like how story-wise things just keep escalating. Even though it, it ends somewhat anticlimactically, it's still a good time. Honestly, it's, it's, it's weird that I literally never hear anyone talking about this one. It's, it's pretty good. Back to Poland for the Saragossa Manuscript. Definitely not the easiest movie on this list, as it runs for three hours, and at some point you're following a story told within a story, within a story, within a story, within a story, within the main framing story. <laughs> I'm not even exaggerating, really, at its furthest, this movie goes six layers deep. At some point you, you can't even tell what's real or imagined or even supernatural. And even without ever getting any real closure to any of it, I, I was quite fascinated by it all. Plus, it's a beautiful movie. The locations, the, the sets, the costumes, and then the way it was all shot and framed, it makes for quite a feast for the eyes. And even though I can easily see people not caring for this, like, at all, I certainly did. So, if you're in the mood to challenge yourself, give it a go, it's... If nothing else, quite something else. And then for our last stop in Czechoslovakia, the shop on Main Street. And uh, oh boy, this this will definitely hit you in the feels. It's quite the emotional roller coaster. As in, it starts out all kind of funny, quirky, cute even, but then slowly shifts into this heartbreaking tale. And uh, it, it's all so superbly done. Like it. It flows really well, but like very naturally from, well, happy to sad. It's about this guy who's appointed to taking over a Jewish shop during World War II, you know, as part of this uh, Aryanization program, but then ends up befriending the sweet old lady who runs the shop. Both the man and the old lady, they give a phenomenal performance. Especially Ida Kaminska, the old lady. Oh man, she She'll definitely steal your heart. So yeah, a realistic, humane, small-scale portrayal of World War II, perhaps even the best movie I've seen all last year. This, however, 
definitely wasn't the best movie I've seen all last year. Slash Hammer. But I I'm almost just as eager to recommend it. Almost. One of the first shot on video releases in the early to mid 80s. Watching Slash Hammer, a supernatural slasher I guess it is? is quite the excruciating experience. Establishment shots and, and, and slow motion shots go on for almost literally forever. But that is all part of what makes Sledgehammer the uh, so bad it's kinda okay absolute mess that it is. So hey, if you want to see a bunch of 30 something year olds pretending to be horny teenagers having completely uncalled for food fights that also go on for way too long, this is your jam. Definitely the type of movie you want to be watching with some friends and some drinks and many more drinks. Uh oh. You guys ready for some encounters of the spooky kind? You should. Directed by Hong Kong martial arts legend Sammo Hung, this is the first movie of its uh, spooky kind? Um, the Jiangxi film. It, you're right, lady, I don't know. Um, very bluntly put, the traditional Chinese zombie genre, which results in an endlessly entertaining kung fu horror comedy. Sammo Hung himself stars as Chen, and not only is his wife cheating on him, the man she's having an affair with is also using a witchcraft sorcerer to try and get rid of him. Huh. The kung fu is impressive, the horror is fun, the comedy is borderline slapstick, and somehow it just all works perfectly fine together. And to top it all off, you'll get perhaps the greatest last 10 seconds to a movie in cinematic history. <laughs> you won't be disappointed. From the master of the macabre, William Castle, is is that even a title that we refer to as? Anyway, um, comes Straight Jacket. Uh, following a trend of casting, you know, these forgotten Hollywood starlets, this movie stars Joan Crawford as a mother recently released from a psychiatric hospital who now tries to reconnect with her estranged daughter. But not all is what it seems in this murder mystery. Crawford is fantastic and definitely, at the very least, tries to steal the show, but I quite enjoy the performance of the daughter as well. It borders on being somewhat gimmicky, I feel, but the movie does play out the whole thing rather straight. Maybe it's just like coming from William Castle you expect it to be gimmicky, but no, this is this is like serious stuff. And nothing wrong with that, it, it actually works pretty well in this case. Not sure what else to add to that. You know, sometimes it can be just that, and in this case, it is just a fun 60s psychological thriller. Watch out, it's Strangler vs. Strangler. From former Yugoslavia comes this deliciously dark horror comedy. Seemingly at least someone inspired by Psycho. We follow this troubled mama's boy who basically strangles anyone who doesn't like carnation flowers. Okay. And then there's this rock musician who for whatever reason, I, I never really caught this in a movie, gets spiritually connected to the strangler and oh, oh, oh. And even though the movie does come with a lot of violent crimes, it, it truly is mostly a comedy. Just a rather dark one. It's pretty quirky, it explores themes like violence in media, we have this quite memorable lead performance, and Really, overall, it's just, it's a bunch of fun. I, I actually really enjoyed this one. Let's just hope that um, in the future they'll get a proper um, home media release, preferably like on Blu-ray, because, well, there isn't. From Argentina comes Tangos, the Exile of Gandel. I saw this movie while working my way through Gaspar Noé's filmography, as he was a second assistant director <laughs> on this movie, but this really has nothing to do with him, like, at all. It tells the story of a group of Argentinians exiled to France, trying to put on a tango performance, all the while dealing with shitty day-to-day -day life in a foreign country away from home and family. Definitely took me quite a while to get into this as I had no idea what the hell was going on, but I ended up loving it. 
I think, I don't know really, it's, it's, it's this pretty amazing, unique blend of arts and culture, mostly the tango, obviously. Uh, drama, you know, like political-ish drama, nostalgia, and a tad bit of surrealism and comedy. Definitely not an easy watch. I mean, I, I myself, I probably missed a lot of cultural and political aspects of the story and themes, simply because, you know, like, I wasn't well informed of some of this. But pretty great nonetheless. Ah, man, that, then this. You guys ready for some more Hong Kong goofiness? Well, you really can't go wrong with Taoism Drunkard. A totally bonkers and creative kung fu comedy from one of the Yun brothers. The actual story itself isn't even that important as of right now. I mean, it's, it's all just so fast-paced and there's so much wacky stuff going on. From a drunk old man driving a weird little car into people to watermelon monsters and basically everything in between. It really, it kind of has to be seen to be believed. It's so like all over the place. It's so ridiculously weird and, and funny. The fight choreography, it's its pretty great, and I'm no expert on the genre like whatsoever, but it feels very fresh and original. Honestly, really, just, oh man, just give this movie a shot. It's so much fun, it's so, oh, uh, it's, yeah, I love this one. And then, of course, I have to include a super obscure sci-fi drama coming of age movie from France. Tom and Lola. Even though I'm still not quite sure how I feel about it, I do still think about it and, well, that's definitely worth something. It's about these two kids who seemingly have been living their whole lives in these quarantine bubbles, so it's eh, somewhat topical, until uh, they find a way out. And this is when they spend their nights discovering new places in and around the hospital that they're um, staying at. Um, I feel like some of it went over my head, probably. I mean, I'm pretty sure most here is a metaphor for something. But even if you just take it at face value, it's it's pretty effective. The movie manages to convey this this feeling of innocence and, and curiosity that's, that's quite endearing. It's definitely slow, and uh, the, the two kids, they're basically completely naked throughout the majority of the movie, which understandably can be quite an issue for some people, but I, I don't know, it, it makes sense in the context, and it, it's honestly treated with respect, as in nothing about it feels exploitive. So yeah, um, quite a unique viewing experience. Okay guys, one more from Yugoslavia, or, or Serbia, or what, what was this back in the 90s? Anyway, Underground. What a wild fucking movie, man. I, I didn't even really like it that much even while watching, but it's, oh man, it's definitely grown on me over time. Basically, in a sense, it's about Yugoslavia itself during the period of three wars, and each time we mostly follow these two men who start out as uh, best friends, but over the course of the movie, through you know betrayal, lies, and whatnot, they end up with a very weird relation between the two. And it's it's not wild in the sense that you know like a lot of super crazy, super out there stuff happens. It, it just feels wild, man. It's uh, it's hard to describe. The, the Balkan Brass soundtrack definitely helps. Again, I feel like I keep saying it, but not an easy watch. It's close to three hours, at times bordering on the surreal, and I'm pretty sure that without the proper knowledge of uh, Yugoslavia's history, a lot is lost here, but uh, still very much a uh, memorable experience. Not a movie you'll soon forget. Viva la Muerte. Now, this is a doozy. From Fernando Arabal, arguably best known for his association with uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky, this is a uh, highly biographical story about a young boy growing up at the end of the Spanish Civil War, questioning his political and religious upbringing. In between the uh, normal scenes, we get a bunch of surreal takes depicting the boy's imagination and interpretation of what's going on around him, and woo! <laughs> These truly are some of the most violent, sadistic, grotesque, and disgusting scenes I've seen in a 
Good, wow. Most of, if not all of these scenes were shot using um, some kind of like early video technology, which kind of fucks with its quality, which is quite a shame, but it, it doesn't take away too much from its effectiveness. Not, not an easy <laughs> movie to sit through, you, you guys are in the room. But definitely worth it. Very visceral with, with, with quite some interesting themes. Who would say, yeah, good stuff. And finally, Whistle down the wind. <laughs> Remember that one? Though? Um, a rather classy crime drama from England. I really like the premise here. A murderer on the run takes refuge in a uh, farmer's barn, where the three kids of the farming family find him and mistake him for Jesus Christ. And. It's pretty great. Some of the allegory is probably lost on me as I'm not too familiar with Christ's story. But even without fully getting it, there, there's still a lot to admire here. The, the children's innocence, the Lancashire location, the, the overall setting of uh, you know like a simpler time. I, I liked it. Plus, the kids' performances were pretty good, which is quite important in a movie led by well a bunch of kids. So. Yeah, good stuff. Oh well, um, that's it. These videos always turn out to be a lot longer than I, you know, initially planned them to be. I guess mostly because, I don't know, I always find out that I find it kind of difficult to sell, like describe a movie in just one or two sentences. So, you know, like, they, it ran a little longer. Hopefully I, um, still did a uh, decent job. Hopefully you found out about some movies that you weren't familiar with before and, you know, like, maybe found something like, hey, that, that looks interesting. And if nothing else, hopefully you, you know, at the very least, enjoyed this video. Yeah, that, that's it. Cheers, guys. Be safe. Have a nice day.